Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar entitled Maximizing Medicaid Revenue. This webinar is sponsored by the Illinois Alliance of Administrators of Special Education and the Embrace Software Company. My name is Kim Moore and I currently serve as the Medicaid Committee Chair for the IAASE Board. I was a special education teacher for 16 years prior to moving into special education administration for the past 10 years. For the last eight years, I served as a cooperative director in Northern Illinois. I retired in June of this year from public education and started working for the Embrace Software Company. I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to support school districts and cooperatives in Illinois to better serve students with special needs. There are over 190 people registered for the webinar with varied employment roles, including superintendents, assistant superintendents, directors, supervisors and coordinators, administrative assistants, business managers, bookkeepers, Medicaid vendors, attorneys, and related service staff members. Some viewers are new to the school-based Medicaid billing process and some folks have served in the special education field for decades and are very familiar with the Medicaid process in Illinois. The IAASE Medicaid Committee and the Embrace Company extends a sincere welcome to all participants viewing the webinar today and hope that everyone leaves with some new insight based on the information presented. Due to the high level of interest in the topic of school-based Medicaid, all participants in the webinar today will be receiving a survey after the presentation asking for more input on additional topics of interest relating to school-based Medicaid that members would like to see in the future. This information will be utilized by the IAASE Medicaid Committee to guide future training options relating to the area of school-based health services and Medicaid billing. Before diving into the material, it is important to discuss upfront the intent of this presentation. The intent is to provide public school administrators and staff a general overview of school-based Medicaid claim process in Illinois and to provide some possible strategies to support districts and cooperatives in maximizing their Medicaid revenue potential or providing school-based health services to students identified with special needs. This presentation is not intended to be a comprehensive guide, but rather just an informational presentation of the general or typical process for submitting Medicaid claims for school-based health services in Illinois. Each district and cooperative will have their own Medicaid vendor as a great resource to connect with regarding specific claim questions and processes. Due to the difference between the third-party Medicaid vendors, this webinar is closed to specific questions relating to Medicaid. The hope of this presentation is to initiate some questions and or ideas that will encourage districts and cooperatives to explore with their current vendor all possible opportunities to ensure Medicaid revenues are being captured to the greatest extent possible. The overall intent of maximizing Medicaid revenue is to support school districts and cooperatives in providing high quality, specialized services to students with special needs. The agenda today includes going over Illinois Medicaid revenue streams, looking at the Medicaid fee for service claim process, discussing strategies to maximize Medicaid revenue, and then following with being audit ready. And if there are participants who have their mic on, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. Um, that way we don't have that, back, that feedback in the background. Thank you so much for that. All right, some general terms to go over in the very beginning is Healthcare and Family Services of Illinois. 
This is the agency that currently manages the Illinois Medicaid claim processing. Claims are submitted to Healthcare and Family Services. They're uh, screened there for approval, and then the Medicaid funds flow from HFS. IMPACT, known as the Illinois Medicaid Program Advanced Cloud Technology, this is the agency that will be handling in the future all the Illinois Medicaid claim processing that occurs. Currently right now, they're in transition, so HFS is still processing all of the Medicaid claims, but IMPACT is in the transition of becoming the sole provider of that. Hopefully within a couple years, that transition will be complete. But as of right now, if you get email communication from HFS or IMPACT, it's just important to note that those are connected with the Medicaid process. School-based health services, these are Medicaid-eligible services that are provided in the school setting. We'll be talking about those throughout the presentation. All right, so we'll start off with Illinois Medicaid revenue stream. In Illinois, there are two revenue funding streams. The first one is the Medicaid Administrative Claim, known as the MAC program. And this allows entities to claim federal Medicaid reimbursement for activities related to the administration of the state's Medicaid plan, including costs associated with identifying and enrolling populations in need of Medicaid services, linking individuals and families to service providers, and coordinating and monitoring health-related services. The second Medicaid revenue funding stream in Illinois is known as the fee for service. And this is where Medicaid pays a portion of the cost for direct medically necessary services provided to eligible children who have a disability in accordance with the IDEA in the school setting. So these are the two funding revenue streams in Illinois. We'll take a look at the first one, the Medicaid administrative claim process. This entire process is handled by Fairbanks, and they do an amazing job of providing support to districts and cooperatives in Illinois. But each co-op and district has an account set up online in the Fairbanks system. Staff will annually complete a random moment in time survey, and this process is handled exclusively by email, and different staff members are randomly selected throughout the school year to complete those moment in time surveys. Every quarter, financial and personnel data is updated in the Fairbank system with this, by district or cooperative staff. And then quarterly payments are generated and the funds typically flow directly from HFS impact to the district or cooperative. An important note regarding this, um, this process is that Districts need to be aware that staff have to meet a specific participation and compliance level in response to the email, the surveys, to the moment in time. So it's important to make sure those are getting addressed and, and monitored well. If you have any questions regarding the administrative claim process, Fairbanks, again, and they're amazing people there, that they will definitely be a great resource for administrators or for any staff that have some questions about the surveys. So it's encouraged to um, contact them as a resource. Because it's a highly managed and structured by Fairbanks, I'm not gonna go into more depth regarding this one. We'll spend some more time regarding the, the next um, revenue source and that is fee for service. The fee for service in Illinois is related to uh, where Medicaid will pay a portion of costs for direct medically necessary services provided to eligible children who have disabilities in accordance with the IDEA. In Illinois, services that may be claimed for school-based health services include audiology, developmental assessment, medical equipment, medical services, medical supplies, nursing services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, psychological services, school health aid, social work, speech language pathology, and transportation. 
So all districts and cooperatives are able to bill and send, submit claims for these areas under the fee for service model. Big picture overview for fee for service. The staff provide a direct service to students and then they document that service. Typically, this is within a Medicaid third party vendor software system. This would occur. And then the claims are checked for eligibility, consent, are the were they provided by a qualified licensed provider? Are they in compliance with the IEP, et cetera? There's a screening process that happens here once the claim is submitted. Typically, again, this is a third party vendor that would manage that process. And then the claims are submitted to HFS and IMPACT. HFS then processes the claims that were submitted and determines which claims are approved and which claims will be rejected. And then the claims that are approved by HFS and IMPACT, the funds are provided to directly to the district or co-op or to the third party vendor. That's all just based on the contract that districts and co-ops have with their Medicaid vendor. So that is a big, broad picture of fee for service. And right now we're gonna step into, um, look at a couple of these areas a little more specifically. The fee for service rate calculation is calculated on prior year financial data. Part of the portion, the data information that is gathered by districts and cooperatives includes total FTE for each of the department areas, total hours required to work, all salaries and contractual costs for the service provider department, all benefits, including TRS, supply costs for the service department area, and there may be other general data that Medicaid vendors gather from their district or co-op clients but this is just some of the general data that is utilized to calculate service rates by department. This is important to note that salary and benefit amounts that are paid with revenue from federal grants have to be subtracted from the total salary benefit amount used to calculate service rates. So once all this information is calculated and the district and co-op can back off the amount of salary and benefits they use uh, federal funds to pay. But again, remember it's prior year financial data. We'll reference this in future slides, but just know that it's prior year, it's audited numbers that are used and districts supply this. And it goes to Fairbanks HFS, um, I'm sorry, HFS, and they uh, go through this very complex and highly technical calculation. And then they calculate service rates by department based on this data that was provided. And in this chart, this is just some sample service rates for clients in by department here. And you can see that they're calculated by a group or individual. These are, again, just sample service rates. The service rate value, so this is for a unit. So per 15-minute session equals one unit. So this service rate aligns to every 15-minute session that's provided, and that's the service rate that's applied. There is the exception of oral medication, and that is a 15-minute session. It's applied to calculating that rate. And again, these are just sample service rates from clients. Every district and cooperative is going to have their own unique data that will go into the calculation of fee-for-service rates. Um, so they will be different, and they will vary. That's just important to note. Now that we've talked briefly about how service rates are calculated, it is, it's important to note they are not paid that way. So the next thing we're we'll gonna cover is how fee-for-service claims are actually paid by Medicaid. So prior to any claim being paid, there are certain compliance areas that need to be met. So first and foremost, a student needs to be Medicaid eligible. There are a lot of speech therapists that see a lot of students on their caseload, but not all of those students are Medicaid eligible. So it's important to know that every student that is a claim is made for, they have to be Medicaid eligible. Student has to have an IEP. The service needs to be provided by a qualified service provider. The service needs to be listed. The type of service, whether it was individual or group, the duration of service, how long did it 
was the treatment session, how long did it occur, a service description, and this includes progress that is noted towards IEP goals, there's required parental consent, prescriptions and referrals for certain department areas are required as well. So all of these compliance checks need to be met before a claim can be approved through Medicaid. But after the claim is approved, Medicaid will match the claim amount at currently the rate is 50.74%. And this rate, is it changes every year and it's determined at the federal level. As of right now in Illinois, the 50.74% is the rate calculation that's being applied for fee-for-service claims. To help illustrate the fee-for-service claim is an example with a speech service rate for per 15 minutes for one unit or per 15 minute hypothetically would be $20. If a student who's Medicaid eligible receives speech therapy session, one 60 minute session, which would equal four units. There's 15 minutes, four 15 minute sessions in that 60 minute time frame. So you have four units times the $20 for the service rate calculation would equal $80. Then Medicaid takes that claim and matches it at the 50.74% for a weekly reimbursement opportunity of $40.59. You can see the calculation applied there, and that is how that process is conducted. So you have your your area claims, your service provider claim areas, but then Medicaid will only match it at this. Uh, percentage and currently is at 50.74 percent. So hopefully that helps people understand a little bit about the service rate calculation and how those rates are actually paid out by Medicaid. Another important area to, to understand and consider when it comes to fee-for-service deals with rate adjustment. We had talked earlier that provider rates are calculated on previous year financial data. So help, to help illustrate how this is applied, there is an example of a district that in the 2014-2015 school year, they had four full-time equivalent tenured speech therapists with a total salary of hypothetically $400,000. At the beginning of the 2015-2016 school year, those amazing, wonderful tenured therapists all retired. Oh. And the district fortunate enough yeah. to hire four brand new speech therapists with a total salary of hypothetically $200,000. So you can see the difference for this service department between these two school years. So if we take the example of an individual speech rate, remember it's that per 15 minute unit at $20 during the 15, 16 school year, Medicaid is gonna pay that interim rate based on the 14, 15 salary data. So they're gonna pay that at the $20 per unit. After the 2015, 16 school year is over, they do all their cost calculation data, and it's determined that it really did not cost that district this high of a rate to provide the speech services, but it cost them this amount. Again, these are hypothetical numbers just to illustrate. So there is an adjustment difference between what was actually paid as an overpayment and what they actually did pay to provide speech services. So that's where the adjustment comes in. So, adjustments, whether they're positive or negative, they occur each year because they utilize all of that cost calculation data each year and at the end of each year. Once the fee-for-service adjustments occur, when the state reconciles the actual co-op and district expenses relating to the reporting school year, and they're reported annually to Fairbanks. And again, this is typically done by the third-party Medicaid vendor, but in some cases, a district may report the uh, rate adjust the rate service area to Fairbanks, but traditionally it's the third party vendor. Once it's reconciled and the actual expenditures are calculated from the reporting year, provider rates are adjusted and generated and they are applied during the school year. If the adjustment was negative, the overpayments are deducted from the current year's reimbursement. 
if the adjustments are positive, additional monies will be sent to the district or co-op. There's a report that HFS sends out, it's the 3790, and this is the report that is great to reference for all your Medicaid disbursements. And it has your administrative outreach, it has your fee for service, what was uh, for, you know, sent to the district. So utilizing that report, and then always consulting with your Medicaid billing vendor. If you have any questions regarding the rate adjustment, Pick up the phone, call your Medicaid billing vendor. They're the ones that they completely understand this whole process. It's their wheelhouse and they will be your greatest asset when it comes to trying to figure out what, what is occurring with rate adjustment. And typically this happens when there is an audit and something's not matching or a magical check shows up and you're not sure what it's related to or connected to or for. Um, contacting your Medicaid billing vendor is huge there, and they'll be able to help you with that process. The important point to understand is that this, this happens every year. So you may receive this interim rate and be paid out, but then there's actual an adjustment that will come after the year ends. So just having that information is important, uh, and that overview is, is great. Some common claim issues relating to fees for service. This first section I wanna discuss is where there is a rejection or a loss issue. One of the areas that is a high percentage of Medicaid claims being rejected is that students are no longer eligible for Medicaid. Some students go on and off of Medicaid eligibility multiple times during the school year. It's just out of the control of the school district or cooperative or Medicaid vendor. This is just what happens but that is there is a high percentage of claims that are rejected because of that. So it's good to have that awareness. Another area for loss with fee-for-service claims relates to that the claim just does not get processed. So the service provider provides a service to a Medicaid eligible student and it is not recorded anywhere. So obviously if the data is not recorded, there's no way it can generate the revenue. So that's just another area for loss, a loss issue. Supervisory approval, this is, in this scenario, this is where you have a speech intern or a social work intern or one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional. Those folks are not fully licensed to provide the service, but they can provide services to students who are Medicaid eligible, record those services, but then at a supervisory level, there's a person who needs to go in and approve those claims. So often those are submitted into the system, but the supervisory portion is not completed. So those claims just sit there and they're never processed. So that's another loss issue. So it's important to have that awareness about the supervisory approval. The other area for fee-for-service claim issues that occurs, and this is related to audit issues. So the district submitted claims, HSS has paid the district for those claims, and then an audit occurs, and through the audit process, it's found that there may be missing parental consents to bill Medicaid, missing or outdated doctor prescriptions for OT or PT services, missing or outdated speech referral forms, or claims that, that were submitted are not consistent with what is listed in the student's IEP. Obviously, these are significant issues, and the district or cooperative may be required to pay money back if these issues are found during an audit. So it's just important to have this awareness, and again, your Medicaid vendor will be able to support you with any of these questions and assurances to make sure those items are in place. So a lot of information covered in a short amount of time. Again, I just want to stress, it's really the general overview. There's many more components, but at least there's a broad overview in some of those big areas for the, the claim processing side of Medicaid. And now having that information, looking at some of the strategies to maximize revenues, we're only going to touch on a handful of them. There are many more. Again, working um, closely with your Medicaid vendor provider, they're gonna be able to help you make sure that you're maximizing all revenue possible. But one of the strategies that we'll talk about today is not paying salaries of service providers 
with federal grant funds. To illustrate the impact of this, I've listed the service area providers here, and these are sample service rates for clients that do not use federal funds to pay salaries and benefits for any of these service provider areas. And you can see the sample service rates there. And these are sample service rates of clients who actually use federal funds to pay salary and benefits for these service provider areas. And you can see there is a significant difference all along relating to the impact it has with pay, utilizing federal funds to pay these salaries. And if you remember from that slide where you have to deduct that federal funds from all the salary data information you provide, then you can see clearly that impact that it has. But in all of our wonderful efforts to maximize all of our Medicaid revenues, you want to adjust the grant um, to be able to have that increased revenue. There could be unintentional consequences. So it's very much stressed to consult with your ISB grant coordinator prior to making any significant changes to the grant. And also checking in with the ISB MO coordinator regarding potential impact with the maintenance of effort due to significant changes in the grant. So these are just some, some cautions to be aware of if you look at utilizing this strategy to um, increase Medicaid revenue. The next couple strategies to look at, the first one is just making sure the claims are being reported. And it does take a tremendous amount of administrative oversight to monitor that the claims are being documented accurately and consistently by qualified licensed staff. But again, if those claims do not get reported, there's absolutely no chance for any type of reimbursement. So just having the oversight in place to make sure all those department service areas are reporting their claims consistently throughout the school year is really gonna maximize all possible reimbursement opportunities. Another area to look at as a strategy to maximize revenue from Medicaid claiming is looking at the claim rejection. So often the Medicaid claims there's incorrect data or information that causes them to be rejected by HFS and impact. Consulting with your Medicaid vendor when you get um, the rejections list to look over that Again, predominantly a high percentage of those is going to be due to the student is no longer eligible, but there may be some claims that have a significant value that there is just something that needs to be corrected on that. And your Medicaid vendor can help you understand the codes, the rejection codes, and process through those. Um, but once you get that list of rejections from HFS, really combing through those and double checking periodically would be a great help. Uh, and again, consulting with your Medicaid vendor on why some of those claims are being rejected. A couple more strategies is one is deals with claiming for one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional support for providing medical services. And there's a lot of districts and co-ops that have one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals, but they're not all providing medically, medically medical services to students. So examples of medically related health aid services include transferring and ambulating, assistance with food, nutrition, and diet activities, bowel and bladder care, redirection and intervention for medically related behavior, and this does not include discipline related behavior, but just medically related behavior, hygiene, and monitoring health status. So often the one-on-one -on -one care professional claims are not being submitted by districts or co-ops. So this is definitely an area that can capture additional claim uh, revenue. But it's important to note that it has to be for one-on-one -on -one care professional support or those medically related services. So it's just not all one-on-ones you can claim Medicaid, but it has to be for these specific areas and work with your Medicaid vendor. They have systems and structures in place that can support the districts and cooperatives in making sure that they're capturing those claims. The next area is transportation. There are some districts and co-ops that aren't even aware that they can bill for special transportation costs on any day that a qualifying student receives round-trip bus transportation. 
So if a student receives speech services on Tuesday and Thursday, the district can claim if the student rode to school on the bus and home on the bus, they can claim a portion of the transportation costs for providing that student transportation on the day they receive a therapy service. Riding a regular education bus is not eligible for special transportation reimbursement. The claims related to special transportation are for those students who ride a separate bus and have special transportation services listed in their IEP. So that's important to note that those are significant components um, regarding transportation claims. Again, you'll have students who receive Speech, and speech therapy services, but they don't have specialized transportation, therefore you can't claim uh, transportation. So it has to be they ride a separate bus and they have to have special transportation listed in their IEP. Again, work with your Medicaid vendor to see what systems and supports are in place to help capture those uh, potential revenues. And this is an example of how some of the strategies that were applied over time and how that impacted the revenue for a sample cooperative. So the 14-15 school year, they provided that claim completion oversight by administrators. So they just made sure that all of the service department areas were completing their claims um, consistently and appropriately throughout the year. During the 14-15 school year, they removed related service staff and paraprofessional salaries from the IDEA grants. And then during the 15-16 school year, they started billing for special transportation and one-on-one -on -one paraprofessional services. So over time, it's clear to see you're starting at a very minimal uh, revenue level here. Implementing some of the strategies listed was able to generate and grow that revenue pretty significantly for this, uh, this cooperative here. So it's just some of the things to consider. There are other potential maximizing revenue, uh, Medicaid revenue strategies, but these are just a few to throw out there and have you guys just think about and explore again with your vendor to see if there's any area that you guys can utilize to increase your revenue. The next section is about being audit ready. It's always wonderful to get uh, money from Medicaid and to be able to provide great services, but then comes that accountability piece with being able to uh, navigate a Medicaid audit. First and foremost, when you're thinking about an audit um, in relation to Medicaid is just making sure that the district and cooperative is complying with the claim regulations. And there, there's a lot of resources that are published by Medicaid, HSS, and IMPACT. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, so just making sure that everyone in the district is complying with those regulations and there's oversight, that alone is going to be significant in helping you be audit ready. Another area to focus in on is to make sure staff are trained and, to, and monitored consistently to ensure correct claim processes are being utilized. Often if staff are hired during the school year, it's assumed that they know how to complete the Medicaid claim process, but if, if they're not followed up on and it's not monitored, they may end up submitting claims that are not compliant or may get rejected. So it's just another area to make sure that, that you're training and monitoring staff to make sure that they are entering the claim data correctly. And lastly is just if you are involved with a Medicaid audit, responding promptly is huge. And anytime you get any written notice from a med regarding a Medicaid audit or an email regarding a Medicaid audit, uh, your first contact should be to your third party vendor. Let them see what you have, what you're presented with. And you guys then can collaboratively prepare for a response and um, what prepare all the materials that will be needed for that instance. So it's just a matter of having, following all of the regulations and being compliant with the billing, training and monitoring staff throughout the year, making sure that all the processes are being done appropriately, and then responding promptly if you are involved with a Medicaid audit. Here are a few Medicaid resources to consider, this is the Chapter U200 manual. All service providers can reference this handbook 
Uh, there's a link to that and it lists specifically who can bill for services, what type of services can be billed for. So that is an excellent resource to utilize. This is a link to the HFS website and specifically this is a school-based health services page on the HFS website. This is a link to the IMPACT website to reference information there regarding IMPACT and this is a link for Fairbanks. Third-party Medicaid vendors are going to have a tremendous amount of other resources available to their clients. So again, working with them and utilizing whatever resources they have uh, for you to help support you through this Medicaid claiming process. Okay, well, it's been my pleasure to be able to present this information to IAASE members and Embrace clients. If you need to reach me directly, this is my contact information, but I wanna stress again that I will not be able to answer any specific questions regarding Medicaid claims and processes for districts or cooperatives. Those questions need to be directed to your third-party Medicaid vendor. But if you have any general overview questions related to this presentation, please feel free to contact me. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on the IAASE website and on the Embrace website for current clients. I want to take this time to thank the Embrace company and the IAASE Medicaid committee for their support in providing informational trainings in the area of school-based Medicaid services in Illinois. Please look for an email survey that will be asking for input regarding future Medicaid training topics. And thank you again for your time today and have a wonderful afternoon.